we commence with the invocation om भद्रंकणे शृणुयाम देवा भद्रम पश्ये मक्षीजत्रा स्थिरंगुष्टुवागुंसस्तनूभि व्यशेम देवितयदायु शाति 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 सुवसे वृषन्न विश्वा आयस्पदे सीध्यसे सनो वसूनियाभर संगंसंवदध्वंस वो मना आंसी जानता पूर्वे उपासते समानो मंत्र समीति सनी सन मन सह चिमेशन मंत्र अभिमंत्र सो हविषा आजुहोमि सनी व आकूति सृदयाव सनमस्तु वो मनो यथावस्सु सहासती ईशा वास्यदगम सर्व यत्च जगत्यांजगत तेन त्यक्न भुंजी था मृध कस्धनम नमस्कार गुड इवनिंग एंड थैंक यू प्रवीण जी दिस इज प्रॉब्ली दी बेस्ट इन्वोकेशन दैट आई हर्ड Uh, it really created the uh, wonderful mood for the, today's uh, uh, talk. You know, it brought that uh, required uh, calm and peace. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, invocation, guys. So uh, I welcome you all to this uh, edition of uh, Vimarsh, our public lecture series, where we uh, bring some of the most uh, eminent uh, speakers, experts. uh to talk on some important uh, issues uh so today uh, i would like to uh, welcome uh, shri uh, shridha vembu uh, who is the founder and uh, ceo of uh, zoho uh, corporation uh i would like to introduce him in a moment but i would also like to uh, uh, acknowledge the presence of shri uh, gurumurthy Uh, who is the chairman of the VIF uh, uh, board of uh, trustees, and uh, several other trustees uh, who are uh, present uh, today? And uh, uh, we had a meeting of the uh, trust uh, last evening, so we are very lucky that uh, uh, they are here, and uh, uh, their presence uh, certainly enhances the value of uh, our. Uh, uh, Talk today. Uh, Shridhar Guji is uh, also a, a trustee of uh, the uh, Vivekananda International uh, Foundation, and uh, he is going to uh, speak on a, a very interesting and important uh, subject: the technological aspects of uh, Indian uh, strategy. Uh, just a brief uh, introduction of uh, our uh, speaker today. Uh, Mr. Vembu is a uh, business uh, magnate, 
uh, and founder and CEO of Zoho Corporation. Uh, according to Forbes, he is uh, regarded as the fifth richest person in India. I do not know how much to uh, this ranking attach, but uh, somebody has given it. Probably it is uh, taken from. Uh, but I thought th this point I must mention to uh, this uh, audience. I have to say. But uh, that apart, that is not why he is here. Uh, he is uh, heading a very important uh, Indian. Corporation, not many people know about it because he's so modest uh, otherwise. But it is certainly uh, one of the most important uh, uh, corporations. And uh, he has uh, uh, also been awarded uh, the Padma Shri uh, recently. And uh, Mr. Vembu is uh, a member of the uh, National uh, Security Advisory Board. And he has been in this, working in this capacity for some years now and is contributing to uh, the NSCS uh, and the NSCB uh, work on uh, uh, technological uh, issues. Uh, he is, uh, I think, uh, uh, one of the uh, interesting and unique uh, features of uh, uh, Zoho Corporation and uh, Mr. Wembo is that uh, he has he is one of those who has done reverse migration from the us and uh, he has uh, set up uh, r d centers in rural india now many people of course all uh, r d centers are in bangalore or in uh, hyderabad and uh, places like that but he is uh, running a multi-billionaire uh, r d center and his corporation uh, from uh, uh, tenkashi in uh, tamil nadu and also, I think uh, in Andhra Pradesh, also, I think you have uh, Nidhi Gunta. Uh, and this itself is a, a model that I think one needs to discuss. How is it that in a, a rural setting, uh, where we you know, normally associate rural India with the backwardness and so on, a lot of migration taking place, we have a flourishing and a state of the art uh, research center which is uh, doing research on uh, some of the most uh, cutting edge uh, technologies in the world. Uh, this is uh, chips and uh, computers and uh, IT and so on. And of course, he'll uh, talk about his uh, nature. But this means that uh, he, uh, this is uh, possible. But that's not enough. I think uh, yesterday when we were uh, interacting with him, he also mentioned the need to uh, create uh, facilities and infrastructure in rural areas to meet the aspiration of the young people. Uh, and uh, he is doing a lot of work. Not only has he set up uh, this uh, organization there, but also uh, involved with the socioeconomic development, with schools, with skills and training, and so on, and many, many other. Uh, so in some sense, a whole R&D infrastructure is being built uh, in uh, rural areas. And this is one model, I think, uh, uh, which must uh, come into our uh, strategy of uh, you know technological advancement in science and technology, etc. Then we talk about uh, how to do it. Uh, since he has done it, he's the best person to uh, uh, speak about it. So we are very grateful, uh, Shridharji, that uh, you agreed to speak to us today, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, your talk. But let me just make a couple of points uh, about uh, the uh, subject, which is the uh, technological aspects of uh, Indian uh, strategy. I think it's uh, quite clear uh, to us, to this audience particularly, that uh, technology has to be part of uh, Indian strategy uh, of uh, growth. Uh, and uh, if we are uh, left behind, uh, we'll miss the bus. So technology becomes very important. But technology, as uh, I, you know, Mr. Wimbo's experience says, it should involve it should not become just elitist uh, and consumerist. Uh, we have to develop our uh, capabilities, uh, starting from, uh, I think, uh, schools, education, investment, uh, investments in uh, R&D, uh, skills and training, and uh, I think the whole ecosystem which uh, Mr. Wembu is uh, building. And uh, this has to be scaled up, not just to be left to one company or one corporation. Uh, we also have this. Uh, uh, we have, of course, a very good, uh, generally a good track record of uh, uh, science and technology and science and technology development, uh, starting from ancient times. Uh, 
uh, even uh, during the uh, colonial India, we had some uh, outstanding scientists who won Nobel Prizes, who actually uh, encouraged the growth of science and technology in uh, independent India. And a lot of institutions have come up, and we can all be justifiably proud of our achievements, whether it's atomic energy, space, uh, IT, pharmaceuticals, so many other areas. Uh, but uh, it's quite clear that uh, uh, we need a strategy. Uh, whether uh, uh, it's enough, and the answer is no, it's not enough. Uh, technology is changing every few uh, months, few years. A huge amount of money going into it, and it underpins everything else that is happening. So in India's rise, uh, we have to incorporate technology. Uh, and some obvious uh, uh, problems that we have uh, are uh, that we have uh, uh, insufficient uh, uh, expenditure in R&D. And our whole effort is also uh, fragmented. And there's no strategy which brings together uh, all these. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the refrains that we hear is that young people are no longer going to uh, you know, uh, science. Uh, fundamental research we have neglected. So there's a lot of focus on uh, applied research, uh, services and so on. But in the process, we are also seeing a huge dependencies that have uh, uh, developed, uh, whether uh, you know it is uh, uh, chips, it's uh, rare earths, uh, critical materials, electronics imports. All these are huge dependencies that we have. So we have, the supply chains are not necessarily passing through India. So our uh, uh, our uh, achievements are more in terms of talent, etc., uh, supplying manpower to others. So in some sense, there is also this very big problem of uh, brain drain, and that brings in its way its own problems. So how do we correct all this? We have all the uh, resources, we have all the elements, uh, essential elements, but how to bring it all together? Namaskaram. So he mentioned this uh, Forbes ranking. This actually goes to the topic of our fake indexes. <laughs> because these valuations are mostly hot air, right? And uh, you know, you whatever arbitrary valuation you put based on whatever parameters they come up with. But uh, actually, much more substantively. We didn't have all this 20 years ago, 25 years ago. In India, the ranking of billionaires, all this. And we know where this came from. And in fact, this very much speaks to our, you know, what is our cultural ethos and what we should not be doing, these kind of rankings, all that. Because I personally, the way I think about wealth is what Gandhiji said about wealth, about uh, this thing. I am only a caretaker of uh, these assets for eventually our community and our nation. So there's no way, meaningful way. In fact, if I try to consume it, I'll destroy myself by consumption. And so the problem of the world today is this, also this whole ego-driven consumption. That's something that I'm going to talk about. So when we talk about development, technology, all of that, we also have to connect it to our own civilizational ethos and all of also the problems the world faces, which is climate change, and the urgency of which, yesterday, Pleasanton, California, my former home, had a temperature of 117 degree Fahrenheit, which is 38 degree centigrade, uh, no, 48 degrees, not 38. Chennai, we used to think 44 is hot, extremely hot. California, in East Bay, they were at 47, 48. So this is not normal at all. They have never experienced, in my 30 years, I don't remember a temperature like this in anywhere in the US I lived. So there is something going wrong. And, and so all of these are connected. So that's what I'm hoping to do in this uh, presentation. So this is our uh, only slide I'll post about company itself. About 11,000 employees now, the largest SaaS company now. This presentation also was made in our software 
among other things. So my thesis today is really connecting these threads, a rural economic revival, technological self-reliance, but along with it, crucially, I mentioned the last point, but it's not the least, uh, rejuvenation of our civilization, and how all of these have to be viewed together. And one aspect of, see, I lived 30 years in the US. One thing I noticed, fundamentally, how we compartmentalize everything, whether it's uh, engineering, whether it's computer science, whether it's medicine, whether it's economics, this degree of compartmentalization, where we have highly specialist experts who won't talk to each other. And this is true even in software. In fact, uh, one of the reasons for our success is we don't compartmentalize software the way typically Western companies do. But that will go into a lot of technology details that won't go into here. But it's very much not compartmentalizing software led to this. And I see, and this is simply my upbringing, my roots. This is why I see these connected together. And I'm going to try to persuade you that we must see these connected and, and sketch a possible path forward. And the word strategy itself, any notion of strategy, whether it's a corporate strategy or a business strategy or a political strategy, whatever, it has to mesh with the culture of the organization, culture of the people. We cannot separate a strategy from culture. That's something that is now understood even in uh, management circles, that you cannot divorce strategy from the underlying org culture. And in our case, our strategy for economic development also has to be rooted in our own civilizational ethos. What is our fundamentally our society like? And this is an important point. I want a self-confident nation, but I also want us to be rooted in humility, which our from age old, our wisdom is humility. So self-confidence rooted in humility. This is this will seem like a contradiction. This is not a contradiction at all when viewed from our particular lens. And this is another, this is prosperity that is not rooted in contentment is going to destroy the earth. The very prosperity will destroy the earth. So this is now understood. You know, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, if we had said this, it would be some, you know, uh, hopelessly outdated person, but today, much more urgently, the world is seeing these things. Our prosperity has to be rooted in contentment. So let me begin with my own uh, personal journey. What three years ago now, I moved to this small village in Tenkasi district. Tenkasi is literally Dakshin Kashi in Tamil. Ten is south, so southern Kashi, and. Uh, that's where I've lived now for the last three years, except occasional travel, which I try to minimize. And Gurumurthy ji and I have this uh, constant discussion of how often I should come to Delhi. And I tell him, you know, I'm, I'm doing much more important thing for our country there, but he, he makes me come here once in a while. So I promise to come here like once a month now. But other than that, I pretty much uh, live there in this small village. It's a panchayat about, uh, 2,000 people, and uh, so it's very much a, it's a, it's a remote village. In the sense, the nearest town, which is about 15,000 population itself, is about seven kilometers away. And the nearest big city is Tenkasi, which is about 80,000 people. So this is truly, truly a remote village by our standards. And I could say this is, why did I move there? I had a particular uh, ideal and say a romantic ideal in my head, that I have to conduct this experiment to prove or disprove something to my own head. That's, that's ultimately the project. So what am I trying to prove or disprove to myself? So this is, I'm going to start with uh, economic theory that is understood. And a lot of these are unstated assumptions, but you go deeper and deeper into foundation, you'll see this. That Villages will continue to decline. Urbanization is the only path to poverty, path to prosperity, and only way out of poverty. This is, if it's not actually held, but if you peel 
the onion behind policies, you will find this assumption somewhere working there. It will be there. And this is by now almost even conventional wisdom in most economic theory. And in fact, the very word modernity, all that all things are modern, are also all the things that are urban. So this is something that is again widely, widely held. So widely held, it's now very much part of the very air we breathe, these ideas, that we won't think twice about it. And so rural areas are hopelessly backward. And rural people have to be rescued, in effect, and urbanized. And this vision actually is, if you go back to Mahatma Gandhi, father of our nation, he stood explicitly against these ideas. But except that the very first government essentially abandoned Gandhiji. Right? It was, even though in, in, he was thought to be a hopelessly uncurable romantic, maybe good for, uh, you know, independent struggle, but has to be discarded after actually a task of governing him. But that's what happened, really. Whatever we paid lip service. We pay lip service, we celebrate. But the ideas he had, and he advocated against these views 100 years ago. And yet, I say that these views are now even more urgently relevant. I'll, I'll come to why. And in fact, as an aside, China made it an explicit policy goal to urbanize. This was a stated policy of the Communist Party for the last 25 years. To build a prosperous China, they will build an urban China. They forcibly, in Chinese style, forcibly urbanized meaning pull farmers from their land, from their villages, build them apartments in nearby cities, and give them an apartment, give them some uh, compensation, and consolidate the land into giant agri holding companies. This, the Chinese party has done. Last two, three years ago, they've made a very crucial change in the Politburo to reverse this policy. And it's, it's interesting why, but I won't go into this, I'll, once you hear my full presentation, you'll realize why China was forced to reverse course on this policy, which they realized this could prove the end of China, Chinese civilization itself. That is why even the Communist Party, which is wedded to this idea, is silently reversing course. And they mentioned it in, the, in their uh, communication. It's not, it's not like this was a secret. They actually mentioned that we have to reverse course on this, force urbanization. So let me ask, is the decline of rural areas inevitable? Is there no other way? And now let me pose a different question. When we, an urban citizen today, we don't look up and see the stars. We hardly know the faces of the moon. None of us can remember what face of the moon it will be today. But if you live in a countryside, you just look up, you know. You know this. And you know where the stars are. In fact, I myself experienced it. I know where the stars come up. I know the various constellations. All of this simply looking up at night. And this is, and similarly, the, the snakes and the various animals. All of this. And you develop, just within yourself, a certain reverence for nature. And a purely urban civilization, with no connect with nature, can it develop all this. And then this, actually one of the reasons I moved out of large cities is this, this whole status competition. And I lived in, I, I lived in the East Bay in a very rural enclave. Actually, California is so huge that you can go 30, 40 miles out and you'll, you'll get pretty much ranches. I lived on a small ranch. The reason I lived there is also to avoid the status competition that was so common in uh, fancy areas. Like I would own a Toyota and I go to a Diwali function. In fact, no, Indians, Diwali function. People ask me, see that why are you driving a Toyota? You can afford a better car than this. And you know, the fourth time they ask you, you'll go and buy a BMW or something. Because you'll be sick and tired of answering this, right? This is the status driven, ego driven consumption. And it happens to everybody. By the way, this is not, we don't require at all. No, only the ultimate saints can resist. 
and I don't consider myself one. I would have done it. If I had lived there, it's not just the BMW. Three years later, a private jet has to show up. Because all your peers you are meeting will be in private jets, how can you not be in a private jet? This is, this is exactly how consumption is driven. And you know, marketing people know this well. The best way to get a person to consume is to create that uh, ego trigger, right? We know this, this is marketing tricks. So, and cities are breeding grounds for this. It's, it's, this, is, this is the way reality of life. And this is now connected to climate change today. There is no, physics does not permit us, every Indian, to have the same uh, lifestyle as the average American. In fact, it's not clear the average American can continue to have the average American lifestyle. And if every Chinese and every Indian, every African, every Latin American, every one of us have the same lifestyle, energy consumption as an average American, this planet, it may be 100 degrees centigrade. <laughs> so it is impossible for life to continue. And yet, the economic theory keeps saying that this is, this is the way, this is the path. So this, this is why I said prosperity must be rooted in a notion of contentment, which is a uniquely, again, it comes from our culture, our civilization, our dharma, this word contentment. And if you mention this to any economist, they'll tell you this is a, all of modern economic thinking militates against this word. You have to consume more. You have to consume more. Consumption-driven economy. These are, again, the same economist will say climate change is the problem. Will turn around and say we have to boost consumption. And the contradictions are all over. I mean, there are a lot of left liberal economists in the US who are both think climate change is real because the evil Republicans keep denying it and turn around and say we have to boost consumption. We have to print more money so we can consume more. And they don't see any contradiction in their, in their approach at all. It's just that on Monday I advocate this, on Tuesday I advocate this, and it's just my professional uh, duty. So. And so this is, goes deeper. If we don't respect everything around us, all living, non living, everything around us, that we should not trash this. Why should I pollute the stream? Well, the stream is not a living thing, but it is nourishing the living thing. If I go put plastic there, if I go put detergent there, all that. I'm destroying it for everybody. So this, this is why, you know, in rural areas, you'll put a small, even to this day, they'll put a small uh, uh, sari around a tree. And the tree suddenly became Devi, Amman. And this is common. In our village, it's common. You'll see this. The tree has now suddenly become sacred. And these are the kind of the primitive, so-called primitive customs that has actually sustained life, sustained our reverence for nature. And I have actually developed even more respect after I came back for all this. I see all this and I see, God, this is what has sustained us for thousands of years in this nation. And a purely urban civilization, can it sustain all this? Can it sustain the earth itself? And finally, speaking individually, solitude. All our rishis have taught us to seek solitude, to silence. This is very easy to get in a rural area, very hard to get in very complicated urban life. So I've just given you a, my romantic reasoning for why I'm there. But is it workable? Are rural areas economically doomed? I'm just a hopeless romantic to be discarded because you know these ideas won't work. This is where I'm going to try to persuade you there is some rational process in which these things can be connected. So I'm going to first uh, talk about our rural economic problem. And this is a problem I, it's visible to me every single day. And uh, I'll give you story after story of people I meet daily in my daily walks, daily life, going to the shop, all that. There is a shop where I bought this exact shirt just about two weeks ago. And uh, this shop lady, a very young, maybe 23, 24, 
and I asked her, uh, so what have you studied? She said, I've finished BA English. And uh, how much do you get paid? 5,000 rupees. And what are your working hours? 8.32 a.m. to 9 p.m. And with half an hour lunch break. And the lunch is not provided. I have to bring it six days a week, 5,000 rupees. And this is in Tenkasi. Then I go to Kumbagonam, which is in Punjab district, which is even more economically weaker today. I was told that that same job will only fetch you 3,500, 4,000 rupees there. And this is in Tamil Nadu, which is considered a reasonably one of the more prosperous states in our nation. You can find college graduates willing to work for 4,000, 5,000 rupees in these small towns. And why does this happen? So this is the, I'll start with this. If you go back to our same villages 100 years ago, and I was born in 1968. I remember approximately the time since about 75. I actually remember the emergency. Tuklak Magazine and Indian Express and all will put the white to the, the blank pages. That's how I remember. And I remember campaigning for the Chanta party in my village, actually, because I, I remember becoming political even at that age. So even at that time, there were still echoes of the system left. So there was a reasonably self-reliant local regional economy. So these ecosystem of your farmers, your oil, weavers, potters, masons, carpenter, ironsmith, goldsmith, vaidyas, musician, priest, astrologer. You can go on and on. Within a 10 kilometer, 20 kilometer radius, you will find all of this ecosystem. Highly local, hyper local, as the word, modern word has it now. And you'll find a person coming and distributing the textile. You will find a person bringing your butter, your oil, all of this. I remember those things as a young kid. Gone, all that is gone now. Those descendants of those people today have become landless labor because typically those people in, who were not doing farming did not own land. There was no point. Your, your uh, carpenter is not going to own land, typically, in these villages. And uh, so they became landless labor because that job went away. Or urban migrants in slums, they become invisible background in these cities now. We, we have to you know, be conscious that they exist, but they, of course, are all around us. So this is, this happened in the almost the blink of an eye, in about a matter of 40, 50 years. Essentially, the entire ecosystem is gone. And more shockingly, even in a village level, you think you will produce food. 80% of uh, Groceries are purchased in the market now. Maybe they grow rice, but they'll go buy all the vegetables. They may grow one kind of vegetable. They'll buy everything else. So we have what used to be an internal, uh, internal market. We have now marketized and transactionalized. And as a result, the, the farmer ends up paying a market price with all the attendant value addition by all the traders and all of that. And so they are at, you know, they will sell for uh, 10 rupees a kilogram and somebody else is buying it at 50 rupees a kilogram in the market. I have seen this visibly. In fact, from my farm, what I sell at 12 rupees, and then you go check in the local market. So this is this is the reality of, you know, whether tomatoes or, or uh, okra or whatever we sell. So... Today, this is actually the cause of poverty in one nutshell. Uh, we have demand for motorcycles and smartphones and refrigerators, medicines, because the rural vaidyas mostly have given rise to these, uh, these uh, pharmacies and medicines and, and other manufactured goods, you know, from gas to you name it. And how do they pay for this? Well, you have uh, now Rural areas have only this left, agricultural products. Selling their land, this is actually more and more. One reason for land consolidation is this. More and more people say, 
I can't afford to continue this, so I'll sell my land. So this is very common, you see this. Migrant labor, I already mentioned it, in cities in India or abroad. Just last week, one of our uh, uh, eight standard educated worker, he left for Singapore to become a construction worker in Singapore. And eight months ago, his brother left to Muscat. So it's a constant, steady, such or migration from this remote village, one village, talking about all this. I know these people by name. And by getting into debt, of course. And uh, loan sharks, the ubiquitous feature of rural life is loan sharks. And I asked, what is the going rate? They said it's uh, three or four percent a month. And they say it's gotten better because it used to be 10% a month. Now it's only like 4%, maybe 5% a month, per month. And through government welfare programs. Of course, the Mandrega scheme. Practically every uh, woman in our village goes to this Mandrega scheme. The 100 days uh, work. So you will see this everywhere. In every village, you'll see a cluster of these women and they are there in this. This program has become a lifeline because to balance the economy. This is the only way they get the income because how do you consume otherwise? And this is the problem. Our value of agricultural production is insufficient to pay for all the manufactured goods and advanced services. Like uh, one of our workers, she had an appendicitis, appendix removal, and uh, she had to pay 40,000 rupees loan. So this is the kind of thing that goes on and so again even medical services the same issue so we have to stop treating rural citizens only as consumers for our factories and our manufacturing or our imports but we have to equip them to be producers and i believe based on what we have done the work you have done it's actually very much possible and I want to make it clear, Tenkasi is not my native village. In fact, until I, we set up an office, I had never been even there once. I had only heard of the place. I had never been there once. It's as to a maximum extent possible, it was randomly thrown dart on the map. That was it. In fact, I, I set this criteria. Truly, I set this criteria about uh, 12 years ago. I told our uh, uh, team, Go to the western part of Tamil Nadu, look at uh, towns below the below a population of about 1 lakh. Why I said 1 lakh is, 1 lakh is level, it's manageable. It goes to 5, 10 lakhs, the city becomes too overcrowded and infrastructure problems, all that. So 1 lakh or somewhere around, if it's only 5,000, maybe not enough services around. We don't want 5 lakh, we don't want 5,000. So set it to 1 lakh. Tenkazi, it turns out to be about 80,000. That was the criteria I had set. No criteria. So we went there and and we put down roots. Now 700 people work there. Our average pay, and all of them, almost 90% of our employees are drawn from within a 20, 30 kilometer vicinity. Remaining 10% would have moved from whether Chennai or elsewhere. Average pay is no more than one lakh a month. Average pay. This as a software, right? So this is where we have equipped people to be producers now, participating in the global economy. And so this is the key now, balance through on a larger scale, we have to replicate this, production of manufactured goods, not just software and production of more also intellectual property. I'm going to come to both of these questions. So this is where I uh, believe in what I call a district driven development model. And uh, the district is a compact unit. It's about 1.5, maybe maximum 2 million people, and maybe 30 to 40 kilometer radius circle. Mostly commutable within one place to another, but definitely if you have subunit like a taluk level, it is very commutable. 10 kilometer is easy to get around in a rural area. Roads are decent now. You can get there in about 10, 15 minutes, 15 minutes now. So we can create clusters of manufacturing capability, particularly focused on the production of household goods. In other words, my, the strategy has to 
start at the bottom layer of household goods. Look at every, if somebody comes to me for an idea, I say, look at every good in the household. Look at what we are importing, very simple. And that's your starting point. And I specifically tell them, don't try to invent a whole new category of product right now. Start with these. And this was the strategy adopted starting with Japan. Of course, 100 years ago, 120 years ago, South Korea more like 60 years ago, Taiwan 40 years ago, China maybe 30 years ago. This has been repeatedly done, repeatedly. And this is only post-1978, China adopted this strategy. And this book, How Asia Works, actually I highly recommend reading this because this really nicely documents the whole strategy pursued by East Asian countries. And I want to emphasize there are, we must learn from every example, but we must also root it in our own civilization. So I won't say that this is just to copy it, but it's also to be inspired by what works. And I always, you know, I'm a very mathematically minded person. I think of it as an existence proof. When I see an example, I say, well, they have done it. That means it's possible to do it. Maybe there may be some other better way to do it or some other way that's suited to us to do it, but it can be done. That is the key. In other words, I use this as an existence proof, as they say in mathematics. And there's another existence proof, Germany and Switzerland. It's the whole other end of the spectrum, the most advanced economies, where you have globally competitive manufacturing industry in rural areas. In Germany, if you go on these passenger trains, you'll see these tiny dots, and they will have one brand you will recognize sometimes. It could be like a washing machine we buy, and one of these, or some industrial good. It might be our plumbing. I see a lot of German plumbing now in India. For, and, and I believe it costs 25, 30,000 rupees for a faucet. <laughs> all those, those are all made in these small towns. Small towns very much like, not even Tenkasi, Kadayam. Kadayam is a town, my nearest town is Kadayam, which is about population 15,000. And there is a Swiss town from which a, actually a global $400 million company is headquartered in such a town. I forget the name of the town. I have studied Switzerland heavily. Very small towns, tiny dots, 15,000 population, have companies that are globally competitive, employing maybe 50 engineers who are able to sell products to Bangladesh. So it is possible, again, existence proof. I want to offer this as an existence proof. And in fact, right now I'm only first, my first step in the ladder is household goods at industry level cluster by small to mid-sized firms. In fact, in the German economy, the small to mid-sized firm is the middle stand, is the backbone of the German economy. Same thing with Switzerland. Why I mention these countries, why I mention East Asia? In our country, we have this, thanks to the English language itself, a natural obsession with first the UK, and now we transfer to the US. This whole Anglo-Saxon obsession. These are not only, though not the only models, they are not even the best models, and they, their models are not appropriate for us at all. In fact, we compete with globally in software with a lot of US companies, but the way we develop software is fundamentally different from how they operate. And how was I confident it will work? I actually studied Japanese companies. The way Japanese companies manufacture cars is fundamentally different from how a GM or Ford manufactures cars. The car may compete in the market, but the manufacturing techniques or the way they think about it is different. And this was well known about Japan for a long period. In spite of knowing this, Americans were not able to actually adopt those techniques. So I decided that we must root our own even software development practices around how our cultural units are, and not simply just copy a, an approach that works for them. The point is not that it doesn't work, it works for them. But when we think about our strategy, we have to be, think about our own roots. And this idea, the small mid-sized enterprise, I believe is vital 
for our well-being. And this is where I, again, rural employment, near their villages and towns. This 5,000 rupees for some, 15, 20,000 rupees in those parts is actually considered excellent income. The reason is they already own their homes. Almost every rural person, they own their homes outright. And thanks to our government now, in fact, in the Tamil Nadu villages, where you go around to the poor parts, people say it's Modi village. Body house, they'll say. And they say it because that they know who, you know, which government helped them. It's actually true. I, I visited and they'll point to this and say this is Modi. So outright ownership of homes that is there, cost of living super low. So this 15, 20,000 rupee job, this manufacturing, this is the first step. This will completely lift so many people out of poverty. And this is also keeps people closer to their roots. Vast majority of migrants don't want to be migrants. There may be a few who want to be migrants, that's fine. They have the freedom to migrate. But most people, if we ask them, they'll say, I would rather stay home because my family, my network, my whole clan, everybody is here. And people even who, uh, I remember this during the pandemic, about 20 of our villagers came back. And there was from Bangalore, some from Mumbai from our village. These were all workers in Bangalore and Mumbai. And these were not software developers, I'm talking about. And most of them came to me and said, now that you have come here, you can employ us. I don't have to go back. They came and told me this. I don't want to go back. Can you employ us here? So now, how do we enable this household goods production? So this is actually, I'm, I have a, I try to be as detailed as possible in this. This is a critical point. We need the capital goods that incorporate advanced production law. In fact, this is the part where we often, we don't appreciate the humblest product, a nail clipper. I repeatedly take the nail clipper because the production process behind it is not trivial at all. So ordinary household goods, most ordinary goods now, involve a non-trivial production process. And this is where really the strength of the German and Swiss economies to poorer nations, starting with China originally, and India, if you go to Tirupur, Coimbatore Belt, the most industrialized part of Tamil Nadu, you'll see mostly German, Swiss, some occasionally a South Korean missionary, Occasionally Japanese, but a lot of German Swiss. And so this production goods, capital goods, is extremely vital. But there is actually an interesting point here. Japanese, Japan and Germany are similarly advanced industrial economies. And yet, Japan does not use German capital goods. It's something very, very uh, important to note. And what do they do? Their companies, their major OEMs, whether it's Toyota or Honda, they all have a lot of captive capital goods suppliers they develop. Because they actually believe they don't want to lose that layer and they just simply act of just buying will degrade their capability. Interestingly, this is the same strategy we have pursued in software for the last 25 years. Zo is the only SaaS company that we do not use AWS or Azure. We build our own infrastructure. The reason is that that makes our software long-term better. It's again Japanese, the strategy is, I originally observed Japan, studied it closely, and this has taught this r and depth we have now is unmatched because of that. But I'll, I'm moving too fast here. So our strategy for catch-up has to be twofold. First, strongly encourage incentivized production of household goods our nail clippers, our uh, uh, fans, ceiling fans, our LED lamps, all that. And we have to rely on tariff and non-tariff barriers. We have to be very explicit in this, that this is a strategy, this is what we have pursued, uh, and, and create employment in these clusters. The second part, this is equally important, but this can only be done over a five, 10 year period, because those machines don't produce themselves, we need R&D. 
a five to 10 year plan to catch up on these capital goods. That's equally vital because if you only get that first part, not do the second part, that's what I call the Mexico trap aways. Mexico has a lot of factories, but the value addition is sucked away from them. They have none of the value addition, which is why Mexico, even last year, was sending migrants to the US. In spite of having all those factories, why? Because their incomes are still too low. Why are the incomes too low? Because the value is not captured in Mexico. And so simply getting the factories alone is not enough. We must capture the value. And the value is increasingly in these. And this is, I'll, I'll give you a, a story. In uh, Tirupur, I was visiting a factory, a garment factory. And uh, this owner of this factory told me in the early 90s when he got started, T-shirts and, and all this would give them a profit margin of as much as 30, 40 percent. Then it dropped 20%, dropped 10%, then 5%. He said today, 5% you would be lucky. 0%, minus 5% now. A lot of people are just keeping the factories running because they have to, no. Otherwise, they'll be incur bigger losses. And I asked him why. He said, well, our cost of labor has ballooned now. That is now, we have to pay a tailor 20,000 rupees, 18,000 rupees. Bangladesh only pays 6,000 rupees. And Africa pays only 3,000 rupees. Then I asked him, so how much do these machines cost? And where do they come from? Of course, most of this is German. And he said, well, this one cost 10 lakhs, that one cost 20 lakhs. I asked him, do you get to negotiate? No, there is actually a waiting list. <laughs> you not only you don't get to negotiate, you have to pay up and wait. And one spinning mill told me, they have placed a 30 crore order for German machinery and the wait, wait and they have paid for it and they have to wait six months. Think about this. In what business you have to pay up and wait six months to get the goods in the private sector? This company was doing it. The, the owner told me this. And then I, I told this person, so you realize your competition is not actually Bangladesh or Africa? In a way, your competition is actually German that your margin is going there. You are worried about Bangladesh. I am actually looking at Germany. So that is why that second part is important because the margin will go there. This is actually why we don't use AWS because if I am a SaaS company built on AWS, eventually Amazon will find a way to suck all my margin. It's absolutely inevitable. Any, any businessman who thinks strategy knows this. So we must think strategically here and therefore, along with the consumer goods, which is an immediate problem to create employment and balance production and consumption. This is what I call the symmetry condition. The first is balance. So they pr we produce so that we can consume. But second is symmetry so that our capabilities also match. Our productive uh, capabilities match our needs. And this is another problem. We talked about migration. Investing in R&D is how we are going to retain our top-notch brains. And these top-notch brains exist in rural areas. In fact, uh, one and a half years ago, I started a school. Every single kid is actually a, a child of an agricultural worker or a construction worker or a security guard. So we charge no fees at all. We actually feed because none of them can afford fees in the school. They all come from government schools. And I have now found, actually, within one and a half years, we think about three or four can get into Zoho. And one of them, the teachers told me, this kid is super bright. I said, grab her immediately. I want her in Zoho. <laughs> because this is the talent I want to retain. Because this is, you know, if this talent I let go, then it's a huge loss, economic loss. So grab this talent. So this is, we need to retain our top brains. And those are the R&D jobs. Those are those uh, machine tools and advanced technologies, automation, all that. And retaining this talent is not just important for those problems, to solve our other problems. By sitting in that village, you know, a lot of problems come to me. Simply because I'm sitting there, people will come to me with this problem or that problem, and I'm 
necessarily I have to invest in, you know, I have to get somebody to look at this issue or that issue. The school doesn't have a uh, building. These problems come to me now. And so if our brains are there spread out in where they are, we will actually create a, a, a seed for solving our own problems. So this is Atma Nirbar taken to a district, Taluk, Panchayat level. Because this talent retention is important. Brain drain is a real problem at a village level. And so this is the, the second part of the strategy. I'll elaborate a little bit why that is actually viable, how we can leapfrog. So to promote this aggressive rural industrialization, capital goods have to become more affordable. We cannot have these, you know, three crore machines. Because how many rural producers can afford three crore machines? And this is where the example of IT industry. The, our capital goods are, of course, the PC and the smartphone and the network and all. And uh, our IT revolution happened because the personal computer got cheaper. Personal computer happened and got cheaper, it became widely available. And if we still had to use the mainframe, we would not have these 700 jobs in high paying jobs in Tenkasi. It is the low cost capital good called the PC that enabled this. It's a different matter that we are importing those capital goods. In fact, we would be have a higher income in our nation, higher rural income if we could also make those. But we are getting there next. And this same mainframe to PC transition is possible in capital goods. And I'm going to uh, uh, explain to you why I believe this and what we are doing about this. So, and this, and, and, and uh, 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 as an aside, I want to mention, I mentioned the German-Swiss domination in capital goods. I'm going to call that era of capital goods as the mainframe. In other words, the, the Germans and the Swiss are still in the mainframe class of capital goods. And uh, applying the analogy of PC class of capital goods is actually possible. And this is the critical technology trend. It's called mechatronics. And this is the combination of mechanical, electrical, electronics, and software. Again, you can see the holistic thinking here. You have to blend all this together. You cannot just be purely mechanical, you cannot just be purely electrical, all of that. And one example I'm going to tell you, the electric vehicle is a much simpler device. An electric scooter or an electric car is a much simpler device than the corresponding internal combustion engine. This is an example of how you can simplify technology and make it eventually lower cost. And how much simpler and I'm told that two orders of magnitude fewer parts, 100 times fewer parts. That's how much simpler than this. So much so, I actually just, three days ago I purchased an electric auto. I'm a big fan of these electric autos because on our rural roads, that's the best, best, best vehicle possible. And I'm too afraid to drive a motorcycle and I really don't care for the car that boxed in. So the auto is my ideal, my personal vehicle there. And I bought my fourth one because there's severe competition among all the drivers, everybody to take that around. They abandon their motorcycle and take this auto. And uh, this I purchased from a Kerala company, 200 employees, you would not have heard of this. And it's actually good quality. I noticed that this, these guys have good ratings. Within that region of Kerala, their autos are ubiquitous. They have saturated the local market. And since we are the adjacent market, Tenkasi is just you know, within like 50, 60 kilometers there. So we could go and buy it from there. This was not, you no, know, I could not have bought an internal combustion auto with the same kind of a small producer. So already in this electric auto, this small producer is coming out. This Kerala producer is an example. I was surprised when I found this online. I was simply looking for an auto and this I found. Then we went and purchased it. It's cheaper than the major national brands too. And, and really good quality. And this is the key to mechatronics. Power is conveyed electrically. If you look at a electric anything, you will not see these gears, bells, pulleys, all that complicated. Like your mechanical watch versus your electronic watch. There'll be like one chip, that's it. There won't be anything. It'll be empty space inside an electronic watch. The same thing in an electric anything. You will only see wires, 
and you will not see gears, you will not see all the complicated stuff there. You will see a motor, or sometimes the motor is pushed into, they have this thing called hub motor, where the motor is part of the wheel. So you will not see any motor anywhere at all because it's built into the wheel. This also I've seen, a Coimbatore company is building the hub motors for essentially electric scooties. So you'll have two, the two wheels will have two motors and, and the rest of the vehicle looks extraordinarily simple. And this is a critical technology for us to master because this, I am not actually here talking about the electric vehicles, but how to apply the same thing in capital goods. And in this, the control, the real mechatronics, the real brain says in software. And the value is in software more and more. So the, the part, the, and this is where it's important. Either we can actually compete and get the value or we can pay tax elsewhere. So this is a crucial thing we have to get in and we are actually good at software. We can do this and we have to do this. So this is why this mechatronics is important. And so I mentioned electric vehicle as an illustration, but really I'm after this capital goods now. The, I'm going to call it the PC class of capital goods as opposed to the mainframe class of capital goods. And so mechatronics allows factory machinery, the capital goods to be smaller, less complex, with complexity pushed to software, and much more affordable, the affordability part. And that has the economic effect, that affordability. Smaller decentralized production is possible. Just like I mentioned that auto case where decentralized production became possible, the 200% company in Kerala could do this. And they are only in the local markets. They are in two or three districts. A couple of them in Kerala and one in Tamil Nadu. But this is actually become now economically viable in rural areas. And so two major implications, and I is through. So, of course, we are now making our rural population be producers rather than only be consumers. Production and consumption more locally match. And this is actually also crucial for agricultural productivity because it's the same technology applied, for example, a 5,000 rupees brush cutter. See, one of the most labor-intensive uh, agricultural activities, weeding. 70% of all labor in the farm is actually weeds. Constantly or weeding, this is what I have noticed. It's a back-breaking work, it's painful work, and it's also not, you know, ultimate value is not in the weeding or the weeds, it's in the vegetables or whatever you produce. This brush cutter, these kinds of things can really eliminate a lot of this, and this is again that same category of goods. And 3,000, 5,000 rupees, somebody with half acre, one acre farm can afford this. Similarly, tractors, these small, tiny electric tractors, costing maybe 60,000 rupees. They may not have a large battery life, that's not relevant there. One hour they'll run around in their half acre plot of land, and they can produce a lot. In fact, the South Asia books talks a lot about enabling agricultural productivity in the sense of more output per acre of land as opposed to more output per worker. It's a crucial distinction that book makes because enabling more of that productivity is the starting point of rural revival. And I'm not going to go into this. The same technology applies to drones and many categories of defense goods, but I'll, I'll, I'll just mention it here as a aside because I'm no defense expert. So how can we accelerate this evolution? How can we make this possible? And I'm going to sketch to you a UPI-like vision. By now, UPI is an outstanding, shining success story for India. It is, uh, I mean, anybody who comes to India from abroad now sees that just how easy it has become to make payments. And I'm telling you, in uh, 20 rupees, 30 rupees, in uh, rural bazaars, you pay with UPI now. It is shocking how easy it has become. And uh, it was just all in the last four or five years. And we have absolutely leapfrogged the West, the entire world, in this payments technology. And what enabled, of course, is the identity standard and mandating the adoption of UPI across banks. So it's a standard that uh, technology group came up with, it was vetted, 
and then it was mandated for adoption. The standard setting is exactly like an email standard, how uh, the Zoho mail communicates with Gmail. On the other hand, our messaging system, Aratai, cannot communicate with WhatsApp because there are no mandated standards. This is something uh, government has been thinking about and, and EU has also been uh, talking about this, how to make these messaging systems interoperable. That's an example of lack of standards. But UPI is an example of standards, whether you use uh, Paytm or PhonePay or Google Pay, underlying technology is the same, UPI. And this, the effect of the standard, graphically you'll illustrate, MasterCard revenue is 20 billion a year. PayPal revenue is 25 billion a year. Our National Payment Corporation of India is about 2,000 crores, which is uh, 250, 300 million a year. Approximately 100. And this, all this surplus is accruing to our consumer and those tiny merchants. It's like a 20 billion tax cut delivered to our consumers and our merchants. And I can tell you, now I'm in software. Of course, I would love to make 20 billion more. But I also love our nation, so I want our consumers to retain the surplus, not just put me in Forbes 1 or whatever. Because this, is, this has to be important for our nation too, to be able to get access to these technologies at much lower cost. And sometimes we confuse the two, actually. We sometimes, there is this kind of a producer interest. I can imagine myself wearing a suit and tie and going and arguing why my intellectual property should be even more protected so that I have no competition, I can raise the prices, so I can rocket a few more steps in Forbes, whatever, right? But we must resist those arguments. That's not good for the nation. And this is, this UPI is a classic, classic example of this, where we got this right. We mandated this technology. Fortunately, there were no big lobbies to prevent this from happening. That is why it happened in India first. US, this is actually practically impossible to do today. And it's not a technology problem. The lobbies are so effective there, there's no way the US Congress will adopt anything with UPI. They'll probably come last to this thing. So to this day, the payment system in, in, the, in the US is extremely complicated and expensive. And now our government is trying to repeat this with the ONDC and to break the monopolies of marketplaces, all of that. I really uh, dearly wish for its success because it's very important for our nation. And this is the same kind of effort we can do in capital goods, particularly those capital goods that are allow us to make consumer goods. What do I mean by similar effort? Promote standards and interoperability for machinery, push software-driven machines, cost, lower their cost. This is again a standardization effort. It's the government is only setting standards. UPA is not code written by the government. It is written by various open source organizations, but really promoting the standard is critical. And we have enough expertise in IITs, IACs, and our uh, overall technology ecosystem to set these standards, these interoperability standards. And now I'm going to, I mentioned the symmetry argument. Even when economic balance is achieved, production and consumption match locally, we need economic symmetry, both to retain the talent. In other words, we need the technological symmetry of the complexity of what I consume should roughly match the complexity of what I produce at a district or regional level. Otherwise, top flight talent will lose, leave those areas and it gets trapped in a vicious circle. All the smart people leave Tenkasi and go to Chennai or Bangalore or Singapore or wherever. Tenkasi gets trapped further and further. This effect has been witnessed in Tanjavur district. I have personally witnessed it. After all, I am one of those people who left Tanjavur district. And tens of thousands left. Tanjavur district alone would have probably produced globally 50 to 100 billion dollars of value. But that's all sitting in US and Canada and all that wealth. The district still remains very poor. This is one of those tragic stories where top flight talent was produced, but it's all left. And I actually spoke about this in Sastra University about uh, five years ago. Sastra University is based in Punjab. It's uh, probably the, one of the top two or three universities, private universities in in all of India. It's an outstanding university. And yet the district 
remains still poverty stricken i spoke at the convocation where about 800 750 800 graduates uh, collected their degrees and i asked them raise your hand if you are going to stay in this region in this district or neighboring area after you graduate one out of 750 raised their hand one one person i said this is what has happened this university far from promoting local regional economic development, it has become a very efficient vacuum cleaner of talent. Suck the talent and deliver it somewhere else. Unfortunately, this has been true for a lot of our rural universities now. You may have a really good university even in some rural area, but except that its whole purpose is to now deliver the talent, suck the talent and deliver it elsewhere. I want us to rethink this whole thing. In fact, after I said this, uh, Shastra University and us have been talking how to create more economic activity to keep the talent there. I said we should not be pushing out talent like this. This is really detrimental to the, not, in fact, this is our holistic thinking. It's obviously bad for those who, left, who are left behind, but it's actually also bad for those who leave. And the reason I say that is, we are of course taken away, completely uprooted, away from our roots. And then this whole, I mentioned the status driven consumption, all that start. It, the effect is subtle, but in this whole 50 billion value it created, right, Punjab industry, I guarantee you maybe 10, 20% of them are taking antidepressants also. <laughs> After making all the money, they'll be taking antidepressants because they are thinking, I have all this money, why am I not happy? in some deep sense. This is true. I know this in Silicon Valley. I have seen this in America. Or why have I lost my own kids? What happened to my kids? I don't identify with them anymore. They don't identify with me anymore. This is the result of leaving. In other words, migration has consequences not only for those left behind, also those who leave. So we should not make this a default policy. There can be always exceptions. There are always people with wanderlust, always for 5,000 years of humanity, but this won't be the default condition of humanity. Most people want to stay where they are born. In fact, I came back because I always wanted to come back. I never thought of myself, you know, I I went for a renewal of my green card. They said, why are you renewing your green card? Get your, get our citizenship. I said, no, thanks. I want to return to my country. They said, what? No Indian returns. And I said it actually. I mean, the, the, the immigration officer. So I always intended to come back, but that's me. But a lot of people actually regret at some age, maybe at 50, that I should have been there. And so why don't we keep them? Create opportunities. And Germany is an example of symmetry. It exports these sophisticated capital goods. I mentioned the mainframe capital goods and imports life form. That is symmetrical trade. Saudi Arabia, one commodity. Of course, the commodity is in hot demand now, but one commodity is, oh, producer is always at risk of that commodity prices, violent swings. Can they predict what the price will be in a year, two years, five years, 10 years? Nobody can say. But you know that the iPhone prices, it will not swing violently. It will not go down by 80%, it will not go, down, go up by 500%. So now, uh, Concrete action plan, a 100 day effort to identify these crucial technologies where we must reach the best in the world. And private sector R&D, this is very critical. And ranking, this is actually, see we love ranking in India, but we are applying to the wrong areas. JE, NEET, all that. I want this to be applied to companies. In other words, adults should be ranked, not the children. That's my ideology. So rank Indian companies, compare them with global peers in every critical area. This, our again, our R&D, our IITs, IASCs, our DRDO, all of them can actually do this. This is a worthwhile effort. And then awards for engineers. See, we have awards for sportsmen. I want awards for engineers, people who come up with really interesting, brilliant technologies. And these government R&D labs play a supporting role, assisting private sector R&D, publishing standards and ranking. So these are the roles I'd give them. These are very critical roles. 
coming up with standards, coming up with ranking, and then financial institutions can follow this ranking to give you know, loans to, uh, now we know which producer is actually technically capable. So we can tie loans to those. So again, this is the whole idea, specifications, protocols, open standards. And producer interest will resist it. They'll say it's not possible. If you went and asked MasterCard, they'll say UPA is not possible. Too. They would have told you that. So various kinds of machines for all these industrial processes. In fact, I, I last about six months, I've spent about, I visited about 25 factories analyzing all this. Now I've become a kind of a little bit of a manufacturing uh, expert, understanding automation, all that. Because what machines we can target. I have set up a small manufacturing group to identify these now. And so this is the leapfrog strategy. And finally, I come back to connect it back. The survival, the economic revival, prosperity, and prosperity with contentment. It is key to nourishing our roots. And I actually fundamentally believe prosperity with contentment is possible. The reason is you actually don't have a lot of ego triggers. It's not that people become saints. It is that you are induced saintly thoughts in these kinds of places. You, are, you don't have a lot to compare. You don't constantly compare. You know, when I drive my auto, nobody is there to tell me, why aren't you driving the BMW? Nobody is there to tell me, that's, that's, which is a blessing. So this is the thing, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give you a why this dream is, I'm a businessman, factors of production. I'm going to tell you, if you do this in rural areas, just like that auto example I gave, that Kerala producer, low cost of real estate. In these rural areas, land is 5 lakhs, 10 lakhs, 14 lakhs, take your pick. 20 lakhs, some are in the lakhs. In Chennai, the land is 20, 30, 40, 50 crores per acre. And that, that would be considered affordable. In, and I don't even want to ask what is in Delhi. <laughs> right? So, low cost of real estate. I actually visibly see this because we are setting up these. I know the cost of real estate in so many parts. This is exceptionally important because this goes directly into your cost of production of every widget you make. This directly also lowers the cost of living because those 15,000 rupees in a village, 300 rupees, 500 rupees gets you a house for rent. If you want to rent, I mean, typically people won't. So labor costs are lower. Low cost of marketing to reach local markets. The Kerala producer spent next to nothing to reach me. And typically in everything you buy, 40, 50% of the cost you're paying for the act of being sold to you. you don't realize that. And this, this, to me, as an efficient producer, this is a kind of a overhead I want to cut. And logistics, local transport. So you can transport within 20, 30 kilometer as opposed to 2,000 kilometer. That's important. Or across the worships, which in a highly energy uh, expensive era, these things matter more. We no longer can assume that energy is free or cheap. So local production, local markets, localism is very, very important now. When we combine these with low cost capital goods and production know-how, which from this one school, I know we have the brains. In one village, kids coming from really disadvantaged backgrounds. In fact, uh, I often joke, if there is ever any private sector reservation, our company will never be affected because the people we employ, we already would vastly exceed any quota they'll come up with. <laughs> because those are the people we are training. So we have no issue at all. The private sector reservation, any of that, because that's the people that is there in our school, I see extremely good talent there. And so we can actually spark an industrial revolution, enabling our craftspeople, the former, the, the sons and grandsons, the granddaughters of this crafts people to be productive again. And this is a revolution that is again rooted. It is uniquely thermic in nature, uniquely fit to our, our civilization ethos. So this is my last slide. Thank you. Thank you.